Following a thrilling Super Bowl in Atlanta, the dark hours of January 31st, 2000 are to this day surrounded in mystery. Lying in the street, 200 yards from a nightclub, are the bodies of two young men. Ray Lewis, one of the NFL's up and coming stars, was at that club. He donned a white suit. He would later be charged with murder. His white suit has, to this day, never been found. Even after two Super Bowl victories and an induction in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Lewis's reputation has never fully recovered. The mystery swirling around that night has yet to dissipate. Well, let's put it to bed. What really happened the night of January 31st, 2000? Do you know what I hate about football watching season? Getting up and doing anything. Nothing interrupts football. That's where HelloFresh comes in. HelloFresh delivers pre-portioned meals right to your door so you don't have to get up, go out, shop, or any of that And you can cook and watch TV at the same time with over 40 chef-crafted recipes like this creamy chicken sausage and kale cavatappi I am making. You have options from family-friendly to fit and wholesome HelloFresh has you covered. And hey, if it seems like you're still hungry after a HelloFresh meal, you can add snacks, sides, and even more. There's over 100 add-on items. It's like a grocery store. For me, once that green box arrives, all the stress of the week is gone. The food is in my house and football is getting watched. So after this video, go to HelloFresh.com and use code 55 points at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com from the link below and use code 55 points for 50% off plus free shipping. Ray Lewis was born Raymond Anthony Jenkins on May 15, 1975 in Bartow, Florida. Born to a 16-year-old mother and a father who was in and out of his life, Lewis became the de facto caretaker to his four younger siblings, brushing his sister's hair and ensuring they got to daycare on time. As his father began to withdraw from his life, Ray took the last name Lewis from a man he was not biologically related to, his mother's boyfriend. A smaller player at just 6'1", Lewis used his wrestling background to create leverage as a linebacker at Kathleen High School in Lakeland, Florida, where his talents eventually earned him a scholarship at the University of Miami. After three years and a Butkus Award at the U, Lewis became a first-round pick in 1996, the second-ever selection of the Baltimore Ravens. In Lewis's first four years in the NFL, he established himself as a force in the middle of the field, emerging as a pro bowler in 1997, 1998, and 1999. That year, Lewis was a first-team All-Pro selection, but with a record of just 8-8, eight and eight, the Ravens were absent from the postseason. Ray Lewis was free to make arrangements, so he headed to Atlanta, the site of Super Bowl 34. Little did he know, the events of that night would alter his life forever. The greatest show on turf would be facing off with the Wild Card Titans, a thrilling, blood-pumping game that reached a dramatic conclusion. Meanwhile, Lewis was riding through Atlanta in a Lincoln Navigator limousine, cruising the streets in the early hours of the morning, looking to enjoy the nightlife with friends. This celebration led them to the Cobalt Lounge, a nightclub in Atlanta's Buckhead neighborhood. Inside the club, disputes erupted quickly between Lewis's group and other patrons. To say the night wasn't going smoothly was an understatement. These disagreements persisted into the parking lot as they were departing the club. A physical altercation began with Jacinth Baker, a 21-year-old man who lived in Decatur, Georgia, struck Reginald Oakley, an old friend of Ray Lewis, on the head with a champagne bottle. This altercation escalated. When the dust settled, Baker and a 24-year-old man named Richard Lawler were left dead in the street. The medical examiner from Fulton County later asserted that their fatal wounds, precisely targeting vital organs, suggested a level of anatomical knowledge on the part of the assailant. Precise. Surgical. Lewis hurriedly departed the scene in his limousine, accompanied by around 11 other individuals, including Oakley and Joseph Sweeting, old friends from Miami. Approximately five gunshots were heard as the limousine drove away. However, it remained uncertain whether these shots were fired from within the vehicle or directed at it from outside. Some hours later, Ray Lewis would be arrested and booked under suspicion of committing first-degree murder and was detained without the possibility of posting bail. Meanwhile, Oakley and Sweeting 
had vanished. In a matter of hours, Max Richardson, an attorney representing Lewis, released a statement refuting any direct involvement in the deaths. Richardson maintained that the situation merely involved a well-known public figure, coincidentally finding himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Following the announcement of his charges, the Ravens linebacker addressed the media. He stated, the devil is busy, always after God's children. He is always trying to get you one way or another. And as we'll see, the devil is in the details. Let's skip ahead to the trial. Initially, Ray Lewis would stand trial for the murders, with the charges not dismissed prior to them reaching a courtroom. However, despite making it this far, the prosecution didn't seem too confident that they had enough evidence on Lewis. As the murder trial progressed over a few weeks, Lewis and his legal team reached a plea deal. The linebacker would plead down to an obstruction of justice charge, but he was also compelled to testify against his two friends who were involved in the incident. You could say it was a trade. Around the same time, NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabue slapped Lewis with a fine of $250,000. But as details of the night came out, the court of public opinion's eyebrows were still raised. During his initial interview with the police, Lewis had not been entirely forthcoming and had also advised others on that night to withhold information about the incident. His obstruction hindered an investigation into a serious criminal event, which caused a significant portion of the public to view Lewis's actions negatively. Still, despite the plea deal, if you thought he was guilty, it seemed like Ray Lewis had literally gotten away with murder, and the fine was just a slap on the wrist. Lewis returned to Raven's training camp later that same year. Even with the magnifying glass of HBO's inaugural season of Hard Knocks, he and the Ravens were poised for a breakout season in 2000. During that season, the Ravens managed to establish a remarkable record by allowing the fewest points, 165, and fewest rushing yards, 970, across a 16-game single-season span. Their defense was nothing short of stifling, with Ray Lewis as the centerpiece. In Super Bowl 35 against the New York Giants, Lewis notched five tackles and knocked away four passes on his way to winning Super Bowl MVP. Usually that person says, I'm going to Disneyland for a commercial. Instead of Lewis, the cameras picked out Ravens quarterback Trent Dilfer, asking him to say those five magic words. Dilfer can best be described as an active participant in the game. It was all on Ray Lewis. And Lewis would go on to win another Super Bowl in his final game, another bizarre one. His ride into the sunset was an inspirational story. And despite some lingering public scrutiny, the red letter on his chest was beginning to fade or actively be ignored. Did it ever belong there in the first place? And what happened to that white suit? The incident. I am innocent, Lewis said in May of 2000. But of course, I've been ordered by the court that I can't speak about the case, so I won't. All I can do is sit back and wait for justice to take its course. Lewis spent his 25th birthday in a Fulton County courtroom on trial for double homicide. Just five years earlier, another NFL legend was on trial for murdering two people in Brentwood, California. There was an overriding sense that the prosecutors in that trial had failed in proving OJ Simpson's guilt. And this time, the prosecution needed to put Lewis behind bars for the rest of his life. When Lewis took the stand on June 6th, he said that he saw the champagne bottle that struck an acquaintance and said that all hell broke loose. Lewis stated that he tried to break up the fight. Witnesses allege that Lewis threw a punch, though no one saw him with a knife in his hand. Security guard Kevin Brown watched as the action unfolded. Jacinth Baker and Richard Lawler both hailed from Akron, Ohio. Both had criminal records. Baker for violating probation on gun possession and Lawler for possession of marijuana. Brown's testimony seems to provide the most detail of the fracas. He recounted the altercation quickly escalated, leading to Baker and Lawler being severely injured and lying on the street in a matter of moments. As Brown took action to clear the area of people, he saw Baker fatally wounded on the pavement. At the same time, he noticed Lawler walking towards them, also fatally wounded. Lawler had been stabbed five times, twice in the heart. Baker was stabbed twice, but his face beaten so badly he had to have a closed casket at his wake. The incident occurred around 200 yards away from the club where the altercations began. 
Brown's testimony also included that he saw a knife on the ground and heard someone admit, I stabbed him. Lewis and 10 others fled the scene, jumping into the stretch limousine. Shots were fired. Later on, bloodstains were found in the limousine. A witness mentioned that during the ride, one of the passengers discarded a white hotel laundry bag into a dumpster outside a fast food restaurant. Another witness confirmed seeing a passenger leave the car and head towards a trash can holding a brown paper bag. Prosecutors claimed that the bag contained Lewis's blood-stained white suit. The suit itself was never recovered. When the police caught up with the limo driver, he was shaking and chain-smoking cigarettes, clearly traumatized by being caught in the midst of that violent outburst. Atlanta detective Ken Allen would testify that he found a small folding knife discarded on the ground next to the bodies of Baker and Lawler, matching the account given by security guard Kevin Brown. Investigators revealed that they traced the knife discovered at the crime scene back to the sporting goods store where Lewis had been autographing items on the day preceding the Super Bowl. Although a witness recounted seeing Oakley and an unidentified man with a knife, no one testified to witnessing Lewis holding a knife. Mysteriously, forensic examinations indicated a lack of blood or fingertips on the knife that had been found at the scene by Detective Ken Allen. To say Ray Lewis was unhelpful during the investigation is an understatement. Police officers testified that Ray Lewis's original police statement included a number of lies, saying he didn't know the names of the people in his limo and that Lewis refused to sign the statement, saying he had to leave for Hawaii to play in the Pro Bowl and would answer questions later. The dust had settled. Witnesses had been interviewed, statements issued, and murder charges filed. Now, let's start asking some questions of our own. There were three people charged with murder in this incident. However, none of them served a single day in jail. In fact, Ray Lewis, the person who claims he is most innocent, was the only defendant to suffer any criminal consequences, a 12-month suspended sentence and a misdemeanor for obstruction of justice. Along with Lewis, Reginald Oakley and Joseph Sweeting were also charged with murder. But the question is, why were they charged at all? The limo driver, Dwayne Fassett, provided the most damning link to the killings. Fassett told police he had seen Sweeting, Oakley, and Lewis all fighting or involved. He said he'd heard Oakley boast, I stabbed mine, and Sweeting reply, I stabbed mine too. The victim, Baker's blood, was found in the limo. However, nobody saw the stabbings take place, except the four or five people involved. So where was Ray Lewis during all of this? According to him, he sat calmly against the limousine while the fracas occurred. But then why later would his white suit allegedly be so stained with blood it had to be thrown away? We know that because he made inconsistent statements, he would later be charged with murder. But did the police really have any evidence other than him being there? Nobody said they saw him fighting. Nobody saw him with a knife. Nobody saw him near the victims. It seemed overzealous for him to be charged with murder. Though, here's what I think really happened. Keep in mind, this is my opinion and purely speculation. However, a good theory is needed to put this case to bed. It was a rowdy bunch of guys at the nightclub. Lawler and Baker, the victims, may have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe they played into the rowdiness and didn't know who they were messing with. The key event was the champagne bottle that struck Oakley. We don't know if this was the start of the altercation, but it led to the end. Once everyone got outside, all hell broke loose. Oakley and Sweeting weren't backing down. Neither were Lawler and Baker. Unfortunately for them, they didn't know the people they were tussling with had knives, and it cost them their lives. However, if there's ever any good advice, walking away from an altercation is the best thing you can do. Ray Lewis likely took this advice and tried not to be involved, but he witnessed what happened and helped his entourage into the limo. He probably made physical contact with either Oakley, Sweeting, or both, with blood smearing all over him. 11 people in a limo, a chaotic scene. For as highly illegal and questionable as it was for Ray Lewis to discard his white suit, it was a brilliant maneuver, especially since it was never found. The one piece of evidence tying him to the encounter, though circumstantial, was gone. 
In the end, when it came to Ray Lewis, he was simply charged with murder because of an aggressive, unforgiving prosecution team. They had no evidence. Even the testimony he provided in exchange for his plea deal was weak. He only confirmed the purchase of the knives earlier in the day. Oakley and Sweeting, though not what I would call victims, were ultimately defending themselves from attack. One had already been struck with a bottle, the other probably coming to his buddy's aid. It all ended badly, but a jury took only three hours to determine that this was self-defense, and both men were acquitted. In fact, in the eyes of every court that has reviewed this case, no murder has ever taken place. For me, even though I may joke about Ray Lewis, the truth is he had no murderous involvement in an ugly, tragic incident, one that was ultimately proved self-defense in a court of law, one that occurred one dark night over 20 years ago. Ray Lewis is innocent. And that's what really happened on January 31st. 2000.